Globus. Thank you very much. So hopefully James will join us in the, uh, very soon, but let's just start off with the, uh, these uh, two great um, speakers today on a very important topic um, of social division, and that actually has not um, been um, a new topic. It's been around for a long time. In fact, last year at this uh, event, we did talk about this very important topic as well, but it does have a different uh, meaning today because of the COVID crisis. Um, you know, when we talk about the uh, divisions um, in terms of uh, uh, international divisions, you know, whether it's the uh, trade friction um, uh, imposed division, maybe China, U.S., or developed countries versus developing countries, or within the you know the domestic uh, society, whether it's the um, division in terms of wealth, um, education, uh, digital skills. Um, it, like I said, it has been a very important challenge for the world for some time. Like I said, in the last six months, the, the, this challenge has been intensified because of the crisis. And today, we will try to actually come up with some solutions to, to really to understand where these um, tensions are coming from. What is it that is really deepening this division? And, and hopefully we will come out, uh, uh, come out of the session with a few suggestions. But let's start off with the question. Where do you see the biggest, weakest link in our society? The biggest division we see uh, in our society today? Ken, do you want to start off with that question, please? Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, nice to be back at G1 Global. Um, that's a very... Uh, Difficult, but I think really simple answer to that is I think myop myopic short-termism, um, and looking for the quick answer. Um, that that that's the big shortfall I think. Um, if you think about it, um, we were talking with Trista <coughs> in the back, and it's the uh, 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman, and I'm not saying that Dr. Friedman was a myopic in short term, but but his his theory was very very simple, right? I mean, you could put a price on pri price on something, and it, it can be value in the markets. Um, and it's a, it's a, it was a concept that's very, very appealing to me or as a person in the financial markets. Um, so that's been around for a while. Um, so everybody knows about Milton Freeman, um, but do you know his uh, colleague, he was Japanese, <coughs> uh, his name is Hirofumi Uzawa. Um, he's a very sh tall gentleman. Um, in the later years, he used to grow, grow a beard. <laughs> um, um, but he, he was known for his quantum um, 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 economics in his younger days when he worked with uh, Dr. Friedman at the University of Chicago. But during, I think during the Vietnam War years, he had um, um, concerns about raising his family <laughs> in the United States. And he came back to Japan. <clears throat> in Japan back in the 70s, it was a very high growth period. Um, and so it was a, it, times of good years. Um, but at the same time, um, there's problems with pollution, right, um, and, and, and things like that. And so he uh, shifted toward his uh, theory from quantitative uh, economics to this concept about called social capital commons, which meant there are things that's very, very valuable, let's say like nature, um, perhaps education, uh, uh, medical care, things like that. Um, but not necessarily, you, can't, you, couldn't, you couldn't monetize it. You couldn't put a price on it. And, and to me, what that told me <clears throat> is that Dr. Freeman's model uh, was a 20th century model where you rationalized, um, you could pr put a price on everything. It was a very, very simple to understand model in a sense. Um, but I think Dr. Uzawa's model was about 50 years um, early, <laughs> probably. Um, because in the Freeman years, um, you didn't have to worry about sort of these, uh, you, you knew there, there was limits to natural resources, but you really didn't feel it. But in the 21st century, um, we, we know it, <clears throat> and we feel it physically, and we see it on, on the internet. We didn't have the internet in the 20th century. So now, everybody <clears throat> can see what's going on in the world in, in, their, in, their, you know, in their palm of their hands. And so, but at the same time, the reason why I talk about the myop myopic short-termism is people have been so used to getting results very, very quickly, especially where I came from, the financial markets. You put an input, <coughs> you, expect, you expect an output immediately. Um, but what I think what Dr. Uzawa, <coughs> I, don't, I don't know his theory that deeply, uh, but to me what he's saying is um, maximizing, I think, or, or looking at the value <coughs> of something, 
right? Value maximization. And, and to me, um, Dr. Friedman was talking about uh, more, more price maximization, profit maximization. And so, but a value, it depends, you know, I think Yumiko and I, interest the three people, probably have different values. <clears throat> and we all have different values. So there's not one correct answer. And so looking for the right one correct answer very short term, I think that's the very, very, that's the, that's the shortcoming, I think, that you're describing. Thank you. Trista, what do you say? What's the biggest, weakest link that you see? I, I see actually um, a complete, I guess you could say, I don't want to say disintegration, but um, dismantling of our social contract. And if you look at many places around the world, whether it be the U.S. or it be Europe or it be Japan or elsewhere, we, we had this kind of, particularly in developed countries, we had this kind of you know, tacit agreement between who does what. So government takes care of a certain level of our social needs, the civil society picks up the slack, right, when government fails, and then businesses make money. <laughs> and if they have any money left over, they donate that to charity and they do some good things. But what's happened over time is that those roles have gotten very much blurred and the model that we have has just kind of run out of steam. <laughs> so I know I grew up um, primarily in the 80s and 90s and this idea of working for a great company, you have the stability, you work there for a long time, you make enough money to be able to buy a house, et cetera, et cetera. That is no longer the case. I was reading a really good statistic that said that previously people spent 10% of their income on um, household expenses, so, oh, so rent and that type of thing, or mortgage. Now it's 30% in many parts of the world. That's just not a sustainable condition for most people to live properly. So I think that if you look at kind of what's going on and what's happened is that this has been completely disrupted and it has to have come back to our economic model. We spend a lot of time developing these very much consumerist models, right, that, that had a lot of, um, a lot, they helped to create a lot of wealth for a period of time. But perhaps we've gotten to a place where that's just, there's just too much consumerism. And maybe we don't need more things. And maybe innovating and looking at our economic model based on a consumerist uh, model isn't necessarily what's going to generate value for us in the long term. So I would say, you know, if you're looking at the weakest link, I think you have to come back to this social contract and the economic model itself. Then again, when you talking about coming back to the um, economic model, um, you know, whether we're talking about Dr. Freeman model or Dr. Yudo's model, um, at the end of the day, you have to rely on the capital market to price um, all exter externalities, right? Whether you're talking about environment or impact on society um, or next quarter's, you know, <laughs> bottom line profit. And if you don't think the markets are pricing these uh, externalities, and you've got a lot of problem. And I think that may be the problem that we're facing today, right? Uh, Trisha, what do you think of, of that challenge? I, I mean, I, I would say absolutely, and I would love to hear um, Ken's thoughts on this as well, but I, I do think that the markets, as we see, we see this kind of big differentiation between the value in the markets and the prices that we're seeing today versus what's going on in the actual economy. And that's an enormous problem. But I, I think we are starting to see an awareness amongst investors of the risks of things like climate change, of the risk of things like inequity and the diversity issues that we're having. It's just inefficient, frankly, for organizations or for societies not to be utilizing all the talent that it has. And I think investors are starting to get a bit alarmed about this. Um, and so what we are, we're seeing is we're starting to see some momentum around things like um, ESG, for example. Um, I know many people in this room and online are probably very familiar with that. Um, and that's a signal to investors of a company that's caring more about these particular topics than others. So I think that there is a shift underway. It's just we're, we're not yet there. And I'd love to hear Ken's thoughts um, on this point as well. Um, regarding the markets, there is, there's, well, there's lots of theories about the markets, but two, two theories that everybody takes for granted, and one that it's rational, and, and two that it's a random walk. And I, I don't think that really holds up, especially the random walk part, because in a sense, um, the, the price that you see drives the next price. If it goes higher, people get more greedy, they want to buy. If it goes lower, they get the more fearful, they sell. So, so I don't think the market was one. It's not, it's not a random walk. Um, and the rationality, um, I think Dr. Freeman's probably correct, but, but because he's, he won the Nobel Prize, obviously he's more correct than me. But, but I think it's, we're talking about long-term rationale. Um, the, the, the short-term 
markets can be very, very irrational. Um, uh, <laughs> I've, I've lost many money, lots of money, <laughs> made lots of money because the markets are irrational in a sense. Um, so, and and and, and as and um, by the way, the uh, Dr. Uzawa, <clears throat> who seems like on the on the opposite um, on the axis from Dr. Freeman, he he didn't he didn't really um, n um, neg on the uh, on on the uh, on the markets. He said the markets basically was helpful because when things went went way too far, um, it always had this sort of um, uh, mechanism to, to to bring it back. Um, so so in, in that respect, I think uh, in in the long term, I think. Markets tend to be ra rational, but in, in in the you know short term, I mean when we saw when we saw the uh, market starts to rise and 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 and, and the coronavirus is spreading, who thought it was rational? <laughs> but maybe in the long long term, it was pricing in the recovery that's maybe you know two three years ahead. We'll, we'll see. Okay, here's the problem. Okay, so maybe um, there are more long term investors in the market. And maybe there is more ESG money coming into the markets, which, I, by the way, has been a big trend in the last uh, several months uh, in light of the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic. But the reality is there are a lot of people who are losing jobs, right? The reality is there are a lot of people who are getting really wealthy because of their exposure to the stock market. And that has happened dramatically in the last six months. Well, by the way, it's been around for a long time, but it has been intensified over the last six months. People got even richer, you know, some people, 1% or 3%, or however, you know, however you want to define the, the wealthy people, at the same time that massive, massive layoffs. So the reality is some people are going to lose jobs, some people will lose income, some people are going to be extremely rich in the very short period of time, these people, you know, especially the ones who are losing jobs, they, they may not be able to wait that long, even though there is a trend um, uh, in the marketplace in terms of looking at things on a more long-term basis. So what do you do? We are facing this humongous crisis, massive job loss. Okay, we can't wait for these long-term investors to make five-year bet because uh, these are the people who are going to lose their jobs today, tomorrow, maybe next month. Trista, do you have any thought? The timing I, issue. Yeah, I, I think that in terms of the short term, unfortunately, that's going to happen, right? And one of the things that we actually saw um, leading up to when the pandemic hit was this shift in terms of, I was talking before about the social contract in terms of who's supposed to do what, and this shift around desire from the general public for government to step up. And so we've seen some markets where government actually has started to do things that they Frankly, I would be surprised they would have ever done. So governments that were more conservative doing things that seem more liberal, governments that were more liberal doing things that seem more conservative. I think that we are in a period of time for six months to a year where we're going to have to all learn to live with more government interventionalism just to keep the ship from sinking completely, right? So I think things like, for example, you saw in the European Union around protecting jobs and that some of the actions that those governments took there, I think that was incredibly important. Keeping people from being evicted from their homes was also a very important action that happened in many places as well. So I think in the short term, that's going to happen. In the long term, I think, and we'll talk about this probably um, throughout our discussion today, we're starting to see companies be built that are just better companies. So I think in terms of the business sector, we're starting to see lots of established business saying that we need to be thinking more about the social side of issues and the consequences of our actions, either the products we produce, the services we make. We're seeing this in the tech sector now, for, for example. Um, and they're th starting to think about, we need to be looking in new places for more talent. We're starting to see talent more distribute into, distributed in different parts of the world. So perhaps we can integrate more people into, you know, for example, technology revolution and that type of thing that we wouldn't normally have done so before. So I think there is opportunity in the long term, but yes, in the short term, it is going to be painful and it's going to be messy. And hopefully we'll come up with those mechanisms that can kind of help us um, weather that storm. I'm going to ask him a very controversial question. I gave you his up, so I hope you are prepared to answer. This is going to be a very uh, harsh question. Okay, you have faced the reality, which is basically to say, you may be going bust tomorrow, okay? You have employees um, who are on your payroll. You have a choice. You can let 
fifty percent or eighty percent of, of employees go, and you can choose the ones maybe with without the uh, say say key contract, so in regular workers, so those are you probably let go of these irregular workers to survive, right? And then you really look at today's um, you know uh, today's uh, um, balance sheet, right? You're not worried about you know tomorrow because I don't know if you, you don't know whether you're going to make it tomorrow or not. You know, when you are facing that kind of situation, you know, as somebody who is running a company, what decisions, what do you have to do, what do you need to look at in terms of the elements that will come into your decision-making process? Is this really today's profitability so you can be survive, you can be, you know, alive tomorrow? Um, and when you do that, you kind of have to make choices, and some of these choices are extremely harsh ones, which may lead to, um, you know, termination of, of, of your employees. That's pretty, that's harsh, but you probably do it, right? If you, if you were running a company. Because I used to work at the same firm that you used to work yeah. at? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Both Goldman Sachs. <laughs> oh, you said it, not me. <laughs> um, well, obviously it kind of depends on the s situation, right? Um, I mean, so if, if, I'm su if my business is super leveraged and I have n n no, no way to go, then it's not, it's not half the employees, it's like including myself, then the whole company just goes belly up, right? And so, but if you're talking about a situation where it's kind of a slow, kind of a grown, grinding kind of, kind of bust, um, in the end, I think though, if you're, if you're confident in your business in the long term that this is a short term uh, um, um, impact, then you obviously want to keep your employees. <clears throat> I mean, especially if they're good employees. I mean, if they're sort of employees that sort of on the fringe, um, maybe, maybe that's a good actually excuse <coughs> um, to lay them off. But if you're if you're if assuming all your employees <coughs> are uh, what you you consider to be creating value for the company, um, I think laying them off would be a, the 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 short-term myop, myopic easy answer. Um, and I don't have to, well, if, I, if, I, if I'm a private company, I don't have to please my shareholders other than, I say, myself or the, or the, the few. If you're a public, even if you're a public company, um, in a situation like this, if it's just me going bust, <coughs> um, maybe, but, but it's, it's, it's almost people in the similar, on the same boat. And so I would think even in the public markets, the shareholders would think like, well, this is a situation where we we need to grind down and, and, and start thinking about rebuilding the business. And how the heck do you start rebuilding business if you lay off half your employees? Is it, sort of my take on it. Well, I guess that would lead to the next question. So, you know, Trish, you mentioned there is this role of government that is going to be very important, right? So we are facing this uh, job market crisis. We are going to see a lot more bankruptcies and there will be a lot of people losing their jobs. The government should step up and then intervene in terms of, you know, saving these businesses, which would be otherwise, you know, going bust. Is that what you're suggesting here? No. So, so I think in some instances, it, the government can, like for example, we've seen in Japan, step in and offer aid to businesses to help them weather, weather this specific period of time, right? So either covering social charges or literally sometimes in instances paying companies not to lay people off. I think that's the most important thing because after you come out of it, as Ken mentioned, and the economy starts to pick up again, it's very difficult, particularly in a market like Japan where the labor market is tight, to find people and to start being able to support that demand if you can't find the employees, right? So the question is how long does that period need to be? So I think, yes, some companies will probably have to go under, and, and that's an incredibly unfortunate thing, and we need to be doing everything we can to make sure that does not happen. But I do think that governments can provide specific aid in certain situations. This is really a dramatic situation. This is not a normal, you know, everyday occurrence that happens to in a, in a particular society or economy. So I think it's an exceptional situation. So it requires an exceptional response. Can I, I, th I think you're trying to get at something that I didn't really answer. It is, it, 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 let's, let's say 100 years ago, my business was a horse carriage uh, driving company, <clears throat> right? 100 years ago. And, and there was the horse flu, and all my horses died. Um, then you, you, and then given sort of the uh, trend in, in the sort of the times and the technology, um, if you think the horse carriage will be, uh, is an ongoing business, <clears throat> Then yeah, I, I don't think I should be laying off my uh, horse carriage drivers. 
But if you think, well, there's this thing called the automotive, <clears throat> and it might replace my horse carriage, maybe it's a time for the business to, not, not just the employees, but for the business to, to shut down. So if you're talking about raising the metabolism in an economy through a, through a shock, I, I think what you're trying to say is you should increase the metabolism in an economy, let, let the companies that needs to fade out fade out, <clears throat> and make room for new companies to make new innovation. Yeah, well, actually, that's exactly what I wanted to suggest. See, Japan has extremely low bankruptcy rate, you know, 2 or 3% relative to other developed economies. I think it's somewhere around like 10 or 12% is the average um, uh, rate uh, among the OECD. And that's very unhealthy, I in my opinion. And I think that's the view of many government officials as well. So in order for us to have a very dynamic um, economy, we need to have new companies coming in and try their new services, new products. In order for them to do it, they have to have these uh, zombie companies exit. That hasn't happened. And in my opinion, this crisis may be an opportunity. Not that I think I want to see a lot of people losing their jobs, but I want to see more new blood coming to the system and, and trying you know, their new ideas and you know, products and services. And again, this may be an opportunity for Japan just because we have been having extremely low uh, bankruptcy rates. Um, so that's what I was trying to get at. But it's a very controversial you know, you know, argument because you don't want to see people losing their income because at least on a temporary basis, that means there may be even widening gaps between um, you know, the top 1%, 99%. Yeah, I, I think the, the zombie company phenomenon is, to me, that, that's a real problem, <laughs> actually. And I think any, I think this, this example of the horse carriage is a wonderful one, right? Because we know that we're moving to um, a world that's digital and a world that's connected, right? And I think certainly businesses that are not in support of that or not aligned around that, they cannot survive. So after, even if we support them for six months, you know, we maybe there's a, tr it, it, it allows us a transition period to get these people towards companies that are going to succeed, right? So I think that there's, there's not an, an either or answer to this. There's probably somewhere in between where we can find some way of, you know, phasing out the things that, you know, are, are kind of old school and don't work anymore and kind of moving people, if we can, in some way towards something that's more productive. Right. And I think we have James online. Finally, James, hi. Can you hear us? Hi. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. You are my, my, missing an action. Thank God you are, you are with us. I, um, so, James. James, we were just talking about the biggest challenges uh, that we have been facing in terms of social divisions. And I wanted to um, ask you um, to talk about the sort of divisions that you're seeing um, from the international perspective, and especially between developed and developing economies. There was a lot of tension, um, global tension, you know, uh, around the uh, um, trade frictions before the coronavirus um, pandemic hit us. But I think that has gotten even worse now. So what, what do you think, the, the, from your vintage point, what is the biggest, uh, weakest link, I would say, in terms of the social division that we're seeing? Yeah, well, so I was just listening to, to the conversation, Yumiko, you were having with Ken and Trista, and I'd say one, one thing about that to start, um, which is that the, one of the big trends that is going to come out of this pandemic is that there's going to be a rise of a kind of new era of big government in Asia. Uh, and, and this relates to the question of the, the zombie companies and whether it's going to be possible for governments to remove stimulus um, at a time in which, you know, if you're in a finance ministry, you think, well, we're going to have to change the economy anyway, but do we want to do it yet? Is it politically acceptable? And there's going to be all sorts of difficult questions like that, where actually the answer is going to end up being, a larger state, particularly in a region that has traditionally had a much smaller state than in Europe or even in North America. And so whether it's the size of the stimulus packages, um, the acceptance of much wider types of surveillance, uh, whether it's investing more in healthcare, there's going to be a whole range of ways, I think, in which whether you're in a rich country like Japan or South Korea or in Singapore or even in poorer countries, um, there's going to be a move towards a bigger form of government, which is quite similar to what happened in the United States in the 30s or has happened after pandemics in history. I mean, in terms of across Asia, of whether there is going to be, I fear, a, a greater divide between the rich countries and the poorer countries. And by the poorer countries, I particularly mean those in South Asia. So I used to live in India as a journalist. I wrote a book about India, which is actually just about to come out in Japan, would you believe? Um, and I think that, that one of the 
the big developments out of this pandemic is going to be a deeper division between East Asia and rich East Asia, which has done pretty well during the pandemic. Um, and then Southeast Asia, which has done reasonably well, except for the Indonesia and the Philippines, um, including in some of the poorer countries like Cambodia and Laos, and then India and Pakistan and South Asia, which have done worst of all. And, and the longer that you go through this pandemic, the more it matters that you have good regulation of business, but also the money to spend on continuing stimulus packages. You can keep borrowing, even uh, uh, you know, although rates are low, eventually, if you're Indonesia, you're going to run out of road on being able to borrow for stimulus packages. So I think that's one of the, the big developments. And that, that's going to be true both on headline growth rates, but also in areas like human development. So that the countries that are going to have the, the largest reversal of um, poverty gains are going to be the, the early developing countries, countries like India that are going to be worse off. So, so that's two things I'd say about that. Thank you. Um, the this, uh, big governments emerging in, in different parts of the world, especially in, in Asia, I think that's an interesting point that kind of um, is li related to what Tricia was saying in terms of the role of government is changing in the, in the face of crisis. Um, but, you know, that has a lot of downside as well. <laughs> Obviously, the government can do a good job and sometimes that comes with a price. And we want to make sure that there's a good balance, right? And that's a very difficult balance to 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 uh, to um, uh, to take. Um, so, what are the um, what are the proposals or solutions that you could potentially make to make sure that uh, uh, there is a healthy uh, role for the government to play? Let's say in in the case of Japan, in terms of stimulating job market, stimulating as you said, you know, the new blood into the system. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, again, the role of government that did not exist before, but it's going to be even more important in the future, and there, therefore we should see more of it. Um, can you, Trisa, can you just talk about a little bit on, on this new role of the government in terms of, you know, what we have to be very careful about and what we, we should be expecting from the government? So, so I think one, one thing is that I, I tend not to like to focus as much on the big government concept as the competent government concept. And... I, I really wish, I hope that we come up with some mechanisms where we focus around that, right? Because I think government in itself isn't the problem. The problem is the lack of competency. The problem is corruption. <laughs> and I think that that's something that can easily take hold if there's too much money circulating, right? So I think we need to come up with some really good mechanisms. And in some places, they have participative democracy, for example. We have some systems that really encourage the people to have more of a um, active role in, in the decision making around government. I don't know if that's something that is uh, as workable in, a, in Japan, but I think it's something that's that's worth considering. I think it's an interesting concept that we're seeing work in some places around the world. Another thing is, you know, obviously I work on in the area of business and sustainability, and I think there are a lot of things that I think the government can do to kind of nudge business is more in kind of in a sustainable direction. And why is this important is because we were talking about earlier, things like climate can change can really disrupt business, right? So if you're um, making your pharmaceutical company and you have supply chain and products that you need to get in certain parts of the world, if we have issues around flooding or if we have issues around heating or these types of things, they can really disrupt supply chains. So I think moving businesses into more of this kind of stakeholder model is absolutely something that, that the governments can do. And then even structural things as well around how we think about value, right? How we look at our accounting systems and how we function. We were talking earlier about impact weighted accounting, which basically um, takes a company's earnings and adjusts it for its negative impacts on society. So there's lots of innovative concepts that are being discussed and, and government is absolutely always at the center in some way. Of, of regulations and, 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 and laws and rules around many of these things. Whether we like it or not, that's usually what ends up happening. You know, talking about um, regulations uh, set by the government in Japan, we have the, um, the new, uh, um, I guess, uh, policy coming up, which is to allow companies to um, employ their, I guess, uh, keep the employees on the payroll until seven years old. That's coming up. And I, I think that's going to be a pretty important uh, change in terms of how the job market might evolve or not evolve. Um, and I think that has also positive impact as well as negative impact in terms of the job market dynamics. 
and you know, again, it may be good in terms of helping uh, old people to keep their positions and, and income, but at the same time, it may not be so good for younger people. And I, I wonder if this is going to lead even further division, um, generational divisions uh, in, in Japan in the, mar in the job market in terms of younger people not having enough opportunities and older people staying in their positions longer. And, and I would imagine there is similar um, challenge in the, um, in, you know, James, you mentioned South Asia because there's a higher percentage of population engaged in the informal sector. And these are the people who are likely to be impact impacted more, and there's probably going to be even bigger role for the government to intervene um, to, to help um, these people. So my question here is, and in terms of the, uh, again, um, the job market and how dynamic that can, be you know, uh, that can be by stimulating the market by having some sort of regulations, uh, for example, in the case of Japan, you know, uh, lifting the um, retirement age. Um, you know, is this a right direction that we're heading? And I just want to talk to uh, uh, Ken about this first, and then I want to talk to James on this in terms of what you're seeing in, in employment um, and jobs in, in, uh, in Asian countries as well. Um, I think it's the wrong direction. <clears throat> and, and the reason you why don't like you don't like the retirement age of seventy. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I don't like it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I don't work for a large company, the reason why I don't like it is because this was about 20, almost 20 years ago, but I was uh, at this meeting with, with corporate executives and talking about the future of the pension and that kind of stuff, you know, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, uh, the person that was describing that, you know, you, you guys are all okay because you're, you're, you were born before 1960, and I was, I was born in 1961, I was thinking, okay, so um, I, I was going to get the, uh, I was not going to be on the, on the boat that was leaving, um, but there was a point where it said, like, then the, the, the lecturer said that we should be increasing the retirement age for companies. And all the executives, I thought they're going to agree because they're all these older guys, right? But during the Q&A, all of them said, no, 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 we can't have that. And I was thinking, wow, that's kind of weird. And then, and listening to their um, explanation, it was because, like, well, how are we going to get rid of the people we don't want? <laughs> and, 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 so, and so, in a sense, um, you know, the, the Japanese sort of um, uh, large corporation was under the sort of the social contract that they couldn't lay off employees um, e e even if they were not performing up, up to par. Um, and so, in a sense, they were waiting for them to retire. And, and so, and I thought, well, that, that, that's kind of a weird way to look at it. And I thought back then, well, maybe the retirement age should not be, be 60, 65, 70, but it probably should be 40. Because I was, I was 40 at the time, and I was thinking, if you're 40 and you, you leave your company um, and you feel like, well, I still have a, you know, a couple of decades with my work left, you know, and so I can start re restart um, with my current skills, um, but if you leave your company at 60 or 70, um, there, there's less, much less opportunity, right? And so I was thinking for large companies and the government, actually, that, that the mandatory retirement age should be 40. Um, and, and, that, and then what that, that, what that happens is you, you encourage the job market, right, for, for talent. Um, and so the company, if there's good talent, you can rehire the person that, you know, that's turned 40 or, or, or from other places. And same for the government, right? And so... And so in terms of um, incre increasing the metabolism in the economy, um, increasing the uh, retirement age is just sort of, um, what's the right word for it, kind of <laughs> hanging on to something that that's, it's not, it's, it's not so that, going that's the right not way. Good. So we're talking about social divisions here, right? One of the important divisions that we see, at least in Japan and many other countries as well, is a generational division, right? And it's a huge issue here. And another thing that's going on at the same time is division, um, division um, that's caused by the digital literacy. People who understand technology, people who do not understand technology. And that is often the function of age. So interesting stuff is happening. As you said, you, know, you don't like it, you know, but the, this whole change that's coming up in terms of keeping you know, older people uh, employed longer. Um, you think that is going to be bad for no, no, this? No, no, there's people obviously with experience that's positive for the company, but if you're keeping everybody with a with a mandatory, and then, then that that becomes sort of not not good for business, I think. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you actually do need to hire good people with the right skill sets, and, and, and right skill sets, when we talk about right skill sets, often we're talking about digital, skill, digital skills, and quite frankly, I'm not sure if uh, older people would have more of, of those skill sets compared to younger generation. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of a dilemma, because that's coming up in Japan. That's already, it's happening, right? So we talk about divisions. One of them is definitely generational divisions, and are we not hitting the right 
direction with this new, you know, regulation that's coming up in, in Japan? I'm not sure if that's, you know, what kind of impact that's going to have on the, on the job market. But James, can you tell us what's going on in terms of job market dynamics that you are seeing in, in, in Asia and how the, um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has, has impacted um, that division in the employment uh, sense? I mean, you're, you're quite right to say that countries like India that have a much larger informal sector find these kind of adjustments, um, I mean, in some ways more difficult because you can't help people if they're not working in the formal sector. So the formal sector is very tiny. Um, getting back to this, this sort of the larger issue of the, the shape of the state that is best placed to help us recover from COVID. I mean, I think you're right to say, uh, and Trista was right to say as well, that there's a big danger here. So you have both short-term trends of the pandemic, which is pushing you towards spending more money. You then have the funding environment, so it's much easier to raise money at the moment. You, 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 know, you can borrow from the markets at rates that were previously unheard of, and so which politicians don't like to do that. And then you have longer-term trends, so demographics is one, since you're talking about Japan in the rich countries, th these are also driving uh, much higher spending in areas like health and social care. And so you have a dilemma, I think, in terms of how politicians respond. On the one hand, if you've got access to more money, then politicians always want to spend more money. The risk is, however, that that takes you away from a path of private sector-led growth and back towards the, the kind of world that many people were trying to live, leave behind um, of, of sort of cronyism and inefficient state and state-owned enterprises. So we don't want that. But on the other hand, in many Asian countries, this may be less true in Japan, but in, in countries across Southeast Asia, you have to remember that this isn't France, it's not Denmark, it's not that you have 50 or 60 percent of GDP on public spending. Actually, the state in many of these countries is really too small. In Indonesia, the uh, public spending to GDP is now shrunk to about 10 percent, which is, and it's a stated aim of Sri Mulyani, the technocratic former World Bank executive who's the finance minister, that it should be twice that high. Because, in a sense, as countries get richer, you expect the size of the state to get larger. They want to provide more public goods. They want to uh, meet the expectations of their people. And so it's a very complicated way that you've got to characterize this. Because on the one hand, you definitely don't want to regress to a more sclerotic, cronyistic, inefficient model of the state. But equally, this pandemic has revealed the problems that happen in countries that don't have good state services. If you don't have a good public health care system, if you have a, a hospital system which can't scale, if you have a state that can't innovate, these are all problems. And so I think in Japan, you can take a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, encouragement from uh, Mr. Tarokono and his war on fax machines and hankos, because that's exactly the sort of thing that you need to, to have a, a reformist minister ready to come and kind of take an ax for certain parts of the state that you need to get rid of and then shape up bits that, that you do want. And one of the things that's been really revealing in this pandemic, and one that I think people in Asia can take some pride in, is that the countries that previously would have thought of themselves as being leaders in terms of the efficiency and the innovation of their, their government, and places like the United Kingdom, where I'm from, the United States, have completely tripped over their shoelaces. And it has been Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, um, Maybe, maybe Japan, you could tell me more about that because unfortunately I haven't been able to come back and visit for a while. But actually the rich Asian countries, uh, along with some other places like Germany, seem to have been the places that have been investing more in their state infrastructure and therefore have responded much more efficiently and effectively to the pandemic than the traditionally admired countries in the West. Well, that's kind of encouraging. That's the tone that I would like to have. And now that we have 10 more minutes, uh, actually 20 more minutes. So James, just, just uh, uh, on your last point, in terms of, so there, there is increased level of investment um, in, a, in the right segments of the economy, at least in certain countries in, in Asia. And, you know, given that, what's the right uh, role for private sector companies to take advantage of that situation? There has been a higher level of investments. Uh, to address some of these uh, challenges we're facing. 
Um, and especially in, you know, including Japan, in, in Asian countries, some com countries have actually dealt with the crisis relatively well. And I think that creates uh, a number of interesting business opportunities. So we'd like to talk a little bit about the role of private sector companies, you know, role of capitalist, um, uh, capitalistic, uh, I guess, I guess uh, uh, players. Um, you know, what do you see as opportunities in terms of new emerging, um, potentially interesting um, emerging uh, opportunities, new businesses, or you know, perhaps new segments, new economic uh, sectors that you see? Um, that you you know you think would be interesting. Uh, you're asking me. Yes, James. In in Asia in um, general. I, well, I think I think it's it seems pretty clear the sectors that are doing well out of the pandemic. You know, the, so digital businesses are doing fantastically well, particularly those that don't require any kind of um, sort of place based interaction, and the ones that are doing badly are those that either require pe people to be moving around, like like tourism or people to be in one place um, in large numbers. Um, in terms of what businesses can do generally, um, I mean, the, prob the problem is going to be that businesses in these circumstances are very cautious. They're not going to want to invest in general. It doesn't matter which sector it's going to be if there's a lot of uncertainty. So let's imagine a situation like uh, there could be a further lockdown, um, which is certainly going to be true in some of the Western countries, I think, given the sort of trends of the pandemic. And so if you're not sure about demand, um, then you're very unlikely to start investing. And so that, in a sense, is why it's so important that given, particularly in rich countries like Japan, when you can borrow at the moment at very reasonable rates, that the, the government is stepping in to give some certainty about the demand environment. I mean, you're going to get all sorts of recompositions of demand um, you know, let's say that people will just be spending much less money on holidays. So, for instance, they're more likely to spend money on things that they can enjoy in their own home. So that might be Netflix, it might be art objects, it might there'd be all sorts of different ways in which, so long as the pandemic is with us, there's going to be a recomposition of demand. And the private sector is going to respond to that as long as it's allowed to. It's also, you know, and, and then you'll get a, an effect on employment patterns where as the, the private sector responds, then they'll be hiring and firing related to that. But the real problem is one in which the private sector just stops investing because of uncertainty. And so the more, given the fact that the state can sort of step in at this moment in richer countries, the more the state can do to ensure some level of certainty over the economic environment. And I think the better the private sector will be able to react. Thank you. Trisha, do you want to say something about the role of business yes. here? Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, business, as, as we've mentioned, is is having and being forced in many ways to step up and address a lot of these problems that we talked about the state would have normally addressed before. So I think that there's some really interesting opportunities out there for businesses actually. Um, so if you look, for example, the food sector, which was heavily impacted during this, um, during the pandemic, um, traceability in the food sector, um, point to point far, you know, farm to table models, for example, people are getting much more interested in this idea of being connected a bit closer to food sources. So there's all kinds of interesting innovation there. Um, I think certainly in healthcare, um, if you look at um, where many pharmaceutical companies spent money in the last several years in terms of innovation. A lot of that, and I've worked with some pharma, several pharmaceutical clients, has been around um, orphan diseases or diseases that are very difficult to treat. Um, and maybe not as much around vaccines. But look, now everybody's working on a vaccine. Um, and I think that will actually build competency to deal with some other illnesses and diseases and situations that may um, be more rudimentary, um, and we can perhaps um, find opportunities there. And then I think just in general, in terms of the business model, um, you know, there's definitely, we talked about this stakeholder capitalism model. Um, there's B Corporations, which is a um, certification that basically certifies companies that are profitable and also sustainable. Um, and you have large companies now who are moving to that model, such as Danone is one, Givaudan, which is the largest um, flavoring and um, uh, food flavoring and scenting company in the world who's actually trying to move to that model as well. I think that's really interesting that these companies are seeing opportunity um, in these types of subjects. So I think that there's a lot of things certainly this private sector can step up and do. Thank you. I think we might have to start taking some questions. Um, I think we're going to take a few questions from the audience, and we may have some questions online as well. Um, if you have a, a question, if you can please raise your hand. Maybe can we just take a, maybe a couple? So maybe can we start with the gentleman over there in the back and just take another one later? Yeah. Well, my name is Rashid, and I'm from Tejin. And, uh, 
we talk about divided societies, but uh, before COVID, there was already a big or a, a moving to a bigger gap between the rich and the poor. And post COVID, with the lot uh, loss of jobs and 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 uh, s business needs to run differently. Uh, there is a possibility, a very big possibility, that this gap will even go bigger because the lower income just couldn't match it anymore or couldn't find work. So how could, any opinions on how capitalism could help this? Because, yeah, SDGs is one thing, ES, ESG is one thing, but at the end of the day, we need the people to be up there so that they can support these companies as well because or else companies cannot, those selling insurance cannot sell insurance. Those who, you know, that kind of situation, A any opinion on that? Yeah, thank you. I think we just take one more question before we just um, answer the questions. Was there another question over there in the back? No? Oh, was it okay? All right, no, that was actually exactly the point I was trying to make, right? The gap existed before and it's gotten worse. It looks as if it's going to get even worse. So what can we do from especially the private sector point of view? Kim, it's not an, an easy um, question. I, I did ask the same question in a different way, but do you want to try to address that issue? It's sure. a very <clears throat> challenging situation that we're facing now. Sure. Um, I think for the, to uh, fill the gap between the have and the have nots, basically, um, it, it has to be the private sector. It can't, it can't, I don't think it could be the government. I mean, the, gov the role of the government is basically to fill in the gap between the short term irrationality and the long term rationale, um, to fill in that gap. Um, but unless the private sector steps in for new value creation, uh, not just the extension of what the legacy of some business that was way back, but just you know, new, new in value creation. Um, we can never fill in the gap. Um, the problem with, with, with the, 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 the we've had the have and the have nots was, was the, the fruits of that, um, that labor <laughs> went, went to the few. And, and, and so, and there's some issues with that. And, and that's why I think um, basically that, um, was it a bit over a year ago, the business round table said, you know, stakeholder capitalism um, and um, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, Davos, <clears throat> well, it can form, it said the exact, exact same thing. And the reason why it is because, because they, they feel a, a, a real risk, I think. Um, one, one is uh, sort of this, uh, risk of this um, change, changing in the, in, the, in the business climate in, ter in terms of the have and the have nots, the social problems. And the other one is more physical in, in the sense that uh, the global warming and, and whatnot, it's causing fires and storms. And so it's, it's, it's really actual physical risk and so, right? And so, um, and, and, um, and so, and it's the business feel that risk. And so, and what, what do businesses do? They manage the risk, in, you know, in, in their way. Um, and in the end, um, I, I'm hopeful, I mean, unless the business can step in, um, this, the society is not gonna work, I think, you know? And and and, um, and so, just 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 a side note. <clears throat> here here in Japan, the the capitalism started about 150 years ago, and, and my one of my ancestors <clears throat> was responsible for Japanese capitalism. He's known as father of Japanese capitalism, but he never called it capitalism. He called it uh, gapon shugi, uh, which means sort of putting the um, hon is like uh, resources and putting it together. And so it's like, it's like stakeholder capitalism. And, and my great, great grandfather's vision was not so much creating, you know, businesses <clears throat> for the sake of creating businesses, uh, was to, but was rather to um, increase the uh, w wealth of the, uh, n the, the nation 150 years ago when Japan was still a poor emerging uh, uh, company. And so, so he saw that uh, um, um, potential <clears throat> for the well, well, not potential. Unless the private sector can rise, there's, there's no way that the, the national uh, well-being can rise. Was his, his philosophy back 150 years ago, and, and I think it's still today the same. And so, so it's, I think it's up for businesses, whether it's large or small, <clears throat> um, and, and it's it's actually up to the, it's the top you know, executives, right? If they have the determination and the will uh, and, and the vision and purpose about their existence. Um, I think we'll find a way. 
And I just wanted to say that I, I agree absolutely that it's going to have to come from the private sector. I, I think that we have to stop thinking, though, of SDGs and ESG as something separate, but actually something that companies do. So um, there are many new businesses that are starting to emerge that actually address social problems and do so very profitably. So the biggest IPO in the US this year was a company called Lemonade, which is an insurance company, which innovated around two things. One, the fact that people hate insurance and they don't actually feel they ever get paid out by insurance. So they pay a lot of money and they don't get their money back. The secondly is, you know, do they actually do good for society? They amass massive amounts of money and where are they, where are they deploying that capital? So what they actually did in their model was they decided to allow whatever, they, they take their cut, but whatever's left over goes to dealing with some social issues and problems, right? And so the reason that the CEO said he did this was to align incentives. So if I make a claim, I'm going to make an accurate claim, right? I'm not going to try to take too much money from them because I'm, I have an interest in them, that money going to something good, right? So there's all kinds of new business models that are coming out now that entrepreneurs are innovating around and building pretty good companies and big good models that are going to help people, right? So either the social model itself helps people or these companies grow and they're able to, to hire new people. James, do you have comments on that? I certainly do. Um, I would put a different emphasis. I, I have to say I rather disagree with the, the kind of the, the basic answer, which is, can the, is this the responsibility of the private sector? So I work in a school of government, and you might expect me to say this isn't responsibility of the private sector. This is something the government is going to do. And what the private sector needs to do is not get in the way or not object and push back, um, which is t generally when politicians come and say, we need to do something to solve inequality. The private sector objects um, because they think it's going to involve higher spending, higher taxes. Um, but in many cases, that is what it's going to involve. Your, your questioner is precisely right, that inequality is very likely to go up because of this pandemic. That, for instance, inequality between people like all of us who still do very well out of the pandemic because knowledge economy sectors haven't been so badly hit and we can all work from home and we're not spending money on holidays. And so in a very basic sense, we're all doing pretty well. Um, certainly relative to um, everybody else, but there's also been huge other kinds of inequality, inequality between men and women, uh, between caregivers um, and those who have to care for children and those who work has gone up astoundingly over the course of the pandemic. And so, well, how do you, how do you fix this? You can't say, well, the private sector has got to fix this through new business models, though at the edge you might be able to do that. In the end, you need more progressive forms of taxation. Um, you need the kind of things. So if you look at President Joe Biden, it, were he to win, I mean, he's seen as a relatively centrist Democrat, but actually he's running on a pretty progressive platform. And what does that involve? It means more money into health care so that you can cope with the pandemic, more money into education and caregiving. As Ken said, lots of money either incentivizing investment or, or kind of co-creating investment in things like climate infrastructure. There's a whole range of things that you need to do to make societies less unequal. Now, none of us want a perfectly equal society, but I think many of us reasonable people can agree that both in countries like India, where I used to live, um, and in advanced countries like Japan or the United Kingdom, levels of inequality have approached um, levels that are now really quite dangerous. And the risk for business here is that business requires a, a kind of social permission to operate. And if business is perceived to be doing very well at a time in which ordinary people are not doing very well, then that increases resentment and it increases the kind of populism that we've seen with Trump and Brexit and in, in other countries as well, in the Philippines and India in the uh, in the emerging world. And it's not good for business to have this kind of thing happening. And so, yeah, I think basically the answer here is not mo mostly to do with the private sector. The answer here is mostly to do with the government and business not objecting to that. Indeed, occasionally being brave enough to put its head over the parapet and say, instead of asking for lower tax, we would ask for a more progressive kind of taxation in which people who are able to shoulder more of this burden pay more of the burden. And occasionally, if that means higher rates of corporate tax in some countries, maybe that's the right thing to do. Can go ahead. Um, I'd like to counter a little bit. I think we're saying the same thing, but <clears throat> but I'm not saying the business. Uh, basically, what business needs to do is be more responsible for the society is, is a thing. Um, and if you just rely on the government to do everything, um, where where does the motivation come for for the people to do to have new innovation? So that that's the point. Um, I think there there should be some things on taxes. Like I think. Carbon tax is a real, real, um, I guess, risk for some companies. Um, and I think it's something that we should really be looking at, things like that. 
Um, so, but I think if you just rely on the government to do everything, um, it's not, it's not, it's not utopia. I think. And I just wanted to say I think also inherent in a stakeholder model is a, is a business that's a better actor, right? So a business that's not exhibiting some of the behaviors that James mentioned, not pushing back any any time somebody proposes a tax somewhere or that type of thing, but having a more constructive role in relationship with government and having more of an open dialogue around who's meant to do what. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, time for one question, one last question. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you for a lively discussion. I love it, actually. Um, I'm also in the camp of private business owners to really take responsibilities, et cetera. But when we say business owners, the private sector, et cetera, we're thinking maybe large companies, big you know, companies, et cetera. In my mind, it's more, it's everybody. Everyone can be a business owner, correct? So in the previous session that we attended downstairs, it was about startups, venture capitals, you know, investing in startups, et cetera, and opportunities that exist in Japan currently with the startups. Is there a way that we can trigger that and motiv motivate that furthermore, um, maybe for the general population to almost step up and say, we can be business owners ourselves? And uh, perhaps more of those would almost replace the big company model, um, if you would. So just your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it's tricky because I don't think personally we'll ever have enough startups to replace Mitsubishi and Toyota and all these other large companies. They hire massive amounts of people and have such an important role to play in our economies. But I do think that we can do things to encourage entrepreneurship. And I would say, actually, if you look at the social venture, social entrepreneurship space, a lot of traditional industries are actually being hurt pretty profoundly by these companies that are better social actors. So if you look at consumer products in the US, there's some really good research that's done by NYU, and they found that in the last nine years, 57% of the growth uh, in consumer products has been driven by products that have been marketed as sustainable. And they only make up 16% of the market. Right? So they are driving a lot of the growth in that particular sector. So I think there's absolutely opportunity for entrepreneurship. But yes, you need to have structural changes and reforms in order to encourage more startups uh, here. Yeah, I, I would, oh, I'm, shall I come in? I, I, I would echo, I thought what Trista said was, was very helpful. I mean, I think this idea of sort of the duality of the private sector needs to do everything, the government needs to do everything, it's not very helpful. Um, and so in a sense, you know, you're talking about um, a state that is trying to enable and innovation from the private sector that, that then is creating businesses and business models. And so you need innovation both from very big companies, but also from, from small companies. Generally speaking, you know, it's quite hard to innovate within um, very large um, organizations and the type of innovation that we need coming out of this pandemic. I mean, you just look around you, you need innovation everywhere. You need innovation in in disease management, you need um, innovation in corporate organization to you know, come up with new ways of working that don't involve us having to fly everywhere, both for pandemic and climate related needs. You need innovations like things like B Corporation, which Trista mentioned, which is a very exciting model of, of ways in which businesses can, can adapt and meet an incredibly challenging sustainability um, agenda. But yes, uh, it, you also need uh, regulations in a business environment that is conducive to startup growth, not just in the tech sector, but in all sorts of other sectors as well. Um, uh, because in the end, genuine innovation is much more likely to come from the bottom up um, if you can find a way of helping small businesses grow. Um, when we say businesses, I think in Japan, I forgot the exact number, but in terms of uh, the employment, uh, it's not the large corporations, but as you find, it's, it's actually the SMEs, right? <clears throat> and the SMEs are, are not public traded companies, and so what? guess what? They're, 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 they're the owners, and so they have a really vested interest uh, in their community, in their business, and so, and, and they can make decisions theoretically much more quickly than, than a l l large corporation. So, so in that respect, um, I think it's, you know, there, there's some hope in, in that. And then the younger, younger generation that's taking the reins from the older generation, I think, have more of that mentality. And, and, and for me, for, I'm really actually optimistic beyond 2020 for Japan. <laughs> or, or just, the reason is, in the past, in the Showa era, we, we, we had this made in Japan, and we, it, was, it was great, right? And we had this Japan miracle kind of stuff. And then we got beat up by, you know, Japan bashing. Um, and, and we said, I'm sorry, so we'll, we'll make it in your country, made by Japan. <laughs> 
Um, and, and Japan bashing became Japan passing <laughs> for the last 30 years. And from 2020, I'm thinking like not made in Japan, not made by Japan, but but made with Japan for a sustainable so for a sustainable world. And, and and there are so many large corporations, SMEs, so many talent here that that can really um, play a role in that. I think. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we are completely out of time. I know it's such a big topic. Um, an hour is not enough to discuss this, in, 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 um, um, and then I'm sure there are a lot of other questions that people might want to ask. We'll be hanging around. If you'd like to grab um, any of these two people, uh, we'll be around for a little while. But I think the, the bottom line here is, you know, I listened to some of the other panels this morning, and there are just definitely um, uh, common themes. Um, and one of them is the fact that this is an opportunity. Um, in an earlier session, I think with Startup, as you mentioned, you know, there was a conversion between impact funds and regular uh, VC in terms of how they're doing, in terms of what kind of investments they're making. I think here we can talk about the same conclusion here as well. Uh, I don't think it's the, you know, one is right and the other is wrong. Um, I think there's a lot of conversion in terms of, you know, um, in, in terms of traditional uh, role of capital uh, players and, and this sort of, more um, recent um, focus on the uh, uh, stakeholder um, approach. Um, and, and quite frankly, in terms of the government role, it is evolving. It is actually going to continue to evolve. I, I do think that we have learned a few things in terms of striking the right balance um, in, the, um, uh, in the past crisis, crisis. And I think there are going to be new lessons to be learned from this crisis as well. And I hope one of the lessons that I, I personally would like to see is the, uh, the government role in terms of how to stimulate um, job market, especially with regard to startups especially with young people, especially with those entrepreneurs who might be coming up with all kinds of interesting ideas. Um, and that's uh, especially important for Japan, but also in other uh, countries um, in, in Asia as well. So hopefully that will be the, you know, what you can say, the 2020 is going to be an interesting year kind of theme. We are going to see a lot of new things coming out of this crisis. Um, some of them are going to be challenging and others going to be very exciting and promising. So anyway, let's please uh, give them big hands for a great discussion. Thank Thank you very much, Ken and Trista and James. Thank you, James, for joining us. Globus.